Hey, this is Jennifer Tribe, and you're listening to episode 58 of the podcast for managed service providers who want to boost their productivity, efficiency, and... Awesome. All right. As you can probably tell, this is not your typical episode of Frankly MSP. I am not in the studio in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. In fact, right at this moment, I am on stage in beautiful, sunny Santa Barbara, California, in front of an audience of amazing MSPs for Frankly MSP Live. Yesterday, we kicked off the event with the Polar Plunge, which was a bunch of crazy people jumping into the Pacific Ocean. So let's hear you roar if you were one of the people who jumped into the ocean. <laughs> yeah, you're braver than I was. I was spectating if uh, it was too cold for me. <laughs> um, we also had a fantastic keynote from Mike Michalowicz this morning. So lots of great insights and takeaways from that. Mike did a book signing earlier today. Um, Tiffany Bova, the author of Growth IQ, was also signing books. And she's going to be doing a keynote later this afternoon. Uh, we also had a bunch of wonderful breakout sessions with some of the names that you might recognize from the podcast. So we had Luis Alvarez. We had Josh Weiss. We had Alex Hoff. And now here we are on stage with my guest for today, Greg Sharp. Welcome to the show, Greg. Hi, Gene. Thanks so much for having me here. So Greg is the founder and managing director of an MSP called Base2. They are out of Auckland, New Zealand. They have about 45 staff and do about $8 million in annual recurring revenue. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, about $12 million of, uh, of our peso-based currency, but uh, $8 million US. Um, and one of the strategies that Greg has used to grow base two to that level is by acquiring other companies. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is how to grow an MSP through acquisitions. But before we get into the business details, I want to take a couple of minutes to go through some of Greg's personal accomplishments because this dude's resume is outstanding. It is, yeah. So let's talk about this. You played rugby and tennis, both professionally. When did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> uh, professional is a definitely a relative term, right? So yeah, I think you could probably say it was a, a large amount of drinking money. But um, rugby uh, is obviously based uh, is um, our national sport in New Zealand. So I started playing that when I was three years old. Uh, finished some 25 years later um, being paid to play in, in, uh, in England. And um, I, had, I most definitely had a day job, though. So uh, I was uh, head of security for a bank up there doing IT stuff. And the tennis, um, you know, with this, uh, rugby's only got a certain amount of seasons, so they need something to do in the summer. And um, my mum was a fantastic tennis player, so I kind of just carried on from that. Amazing. And as if that wasn't enough, so this is quite the accomplishment. You are one of only 32 people on the planet who has done a 42 kilometer, so that is uh, about 26 miles for all you Americans, 42 kilometer solo swim of the length of Lake Taupo in New Zealand. Yeah, that's right. Um, did that about eight years ago. Uh, I married into a swimming family and I think I was trying to prove a point because I asked my uh, father-in-law what's the one thing he wished he'd done and never did. And so I said, I'll do that. Oh, so you one up to your father-in-law. Yeah, well, he's, he, he's got uh, some Olympic medals, so I'm not sure how far I'd go or two on that. So. Awesome. So I, I'm sensing some themes here. There's some, there's some drive. There's a little bit of competitiveness I'm sensing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I do have a, a sense of motivation. If I stick my head into something, then I certainly want to make sure that it's uh, as, as good as I can possibly do it. So that's a good segue into the business conversation today. So Base2 was founded in 2009 as a managed service provider, but before you had that company, I know you had two other technology companies. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about those? Yeah, so I um, left university and scanned. I did a commerce degree, uh, international management and computer science, and then scanned the papers for what was paying the most money. And this is uh, some time ago, because I'm now 46. The, um, the IT industry was really just getting going. Uh, certainly in New Zealand, and, and it was paying pretty well. So I, I went into that um, head first and, and formed a, a small company, ended up selling that on. I did not do that well out of it. So what was good was that is that when I got to do this later on, I'd, I'd already made a mistake. Uh, and then helped, uh, I went into another business when I got back from uh, England, went over there and lived for four years. Uh, I did uh, IT security and, and concentrated on that um, to the point where I was you know, head of security for the City of London. Also managed to take the city of London offline for 40 minutes, but uh, 
I'm not sure the cabbies love me for that's that. That's another story. Yeah, that's definitely another story. And um, so when I came back to New Zealand, uh, I, I formed uh, another business with two other chaps, but they had different ownership than me. I made them quite wealthy, and, uh, and uh, then I ended up making them buy me out. And started Base 2 in 2009, um, and like you said, it's, uh, it's been going from strength to strength. There, uh, it was just me when it started, and I know that's a very familiar uh, topic for a lot of our audience today, start off, and there's definitely uh, areas of complexity that you need to punch through, and I'm sure we can explore some of those uh, over the next few minutes. But um, So now we are 45 people, uh, two locations, mostly domiciled in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, we also have an office in Sydney, so expanding uh, over into that territory. Um, and. The verticals that we look after um, are a raft and range of everything, but if there was a couple that we've concentrated on, it would be, definitely be primary produce, so that's uh, milk processing, quite a big thing in New Zealand, and also um, financial-based uh, institutions, giving my banking background. So your first acquisition was in 2016. It was a company called Job Hire. So that was about seven years into Base 2's history. What, what made you decide that acquisition was the strategy you wanted to use to grow? So in the last business I was in, uh, we looked after a, um, uh, I guess you call it a utility hire or, or a place you go to hire tools. The place was called Hire Pool. And they used a debt leverage system um, to be able to go and acquire other businesses backed by um, venture capital. And I was uh, an advisor on their board, so I wanted to make sure that you know, I kind of knew how that construct worked and how it could work financially. So that was the motivator, I guess. And we needed to get to a certain cash flow position um, I also needed to mature a little bit because uh, I didn't want to make sure that some of us left some money in the, in the account at the end of each month. And, um, and yeah, so from there we went uh, on, the, on the acquisition trial, starting at that stage. So was there a, a mental hurdle to get over to say, okay, I'm, I'm ready for this, this seems like a big thing, but I'm ready to do this? Yeah, in a couple of years, and I, I went and uh, spent time recruiting and then um, convincing, if you like, a, a fantastic finance person. Someone that was the antithesis to my uh, personality, which is, uh, you know, everything's rosy and good and gold. And, and this person is by no means negative, but he's sensible. And, uh, and he'll do the due diligence and make sure he uncovers and, and look around all the corners, you know, uh, uncover the stones, make sure that it, we do the, the correct amount of uh, homework to, before we sort of fly into it. Now, I know you told me Job Hire was a software company, not actually an MSP. So why acquire a software company to grow your MSP? Uh, it was available and on the market, and we could get it at the right price. Um, it came with. It also came, albeit not that big. Um, it was a piece of recruitment software, is what it is, and we still own it. Uh, it came with a, a large client base, and they were in a, a vertical that we already knew, being uh, recruiters, you know, across all industries, but definitely in the recruitment industry. And so we had credibility. We had the ability to be able to go to their customers and tell them this is some of the results that we had with. Uh, other recruiters and see so, yeah, credibility was probably a good thing and we you know it didn't cost us a lot of money uh, we're talking about 60,000 uh, of, of uh, US dollars so uh, but for that we got a client book of, of over 300 and the maths that we did showed that that was a good solid investment so that was interesting. I, I did an interview with Arlen Sorensen a while back, and some of you may have heard it on the podcast over the holidays. I was talking to Arlen about all of the uh, M&A activity happening in the industry, and he said there's basically two reasons why MSPs acquire companies these days. It's because they're looking for new clients or they're looking for tech talent, both of which are really hard to find in the United States. Are you finding the same thing in New Zealand? 100% agree, yeah. So... Uh the latest two, and I'm sure we'll get to them, is uh, acquisitions have both come with people. And talent, uh, out of our team of 45, we represent 20 different countries because we need to bring uh, them in through the immigration process. And certainly technology people uh, acquire for the amount of points to get through our immigration and, and to come and live in New Zealand. Uh, it's a destination place, you know, like a sort of uh, thanks to certain movies and things, it's become a, a nice place to, to live. Um, Definitely relatively safe, and uh, the country's beautiful. The weather's uh, most of the time pretty good. So, so you mentioned uh, about job hire that the the price was right. So, talk to us about financing and and what ne you need to have ready to be in a position to buy another company. Okay, so we definitely went through a process of getting um, ready for, to to embark on this journey, and and to do that we needed uh, some friendly financiers. We used a little bit of a cash flow for the first one, but um, and we structured the deal quite well. But we certainly needed some uh, some background funding, which we did with our bank. 
So I guess if it's the first thing is if finance is not your game, then get a great finance person. Um, and a good MSP should have one anyway. And, and it is a significant investment, I get that, that. But don't let that be the hurdle. Get some advice and just pay for it part time if, if that's uh, you know, the stage that you're at. But next, um, next thing to do is to make sure that you have a lot of your knitting in order and go through and, and make sure that you've got your standard operating procedures. Even, even just starting them is a, is a good place to be. Um, because what you're going to be doing is, is um, buying a business, you're going to be bringing in other people and they need to know how to do things under your watch. So definitely get that sorted, get the financiers on board. So what we did is went to them and said, right, well, here, here's the construct of how we want to, um, to go about this, which I'm happy to share uh, to any of the listeners, um, unless they're buying businesses in New Zealand, which I doubt they would, probably would be. Um, and understand where the river banks are. So, you know, this is too expensive, this is, um, you know, too cheap or, or it's not going to be a good return and understand that if we pay four times the multiple of what they're currently earning or three times or two times, then this is how long the return on investment is going to be. And what's it going to do with debt servicing to your cash flow on a monthly basis? And I think at that stage, um, we were getting about three to five thousand dollars of net profit per month uh, into our coffers. And so with the job hire, which is going to be you know, X amount of dollars, I forget the exact mass, but call it $1,000 of debt servicing over the period of time that we loaned them, borrowed the money, um, it brought in another $9,000. And so you, you, what you're doing is you're taking on extra risk, no doubt, but it's all EMR, monthly recurring revenue, it's somewhat predictable. Into your maths, you most definitely need to have a look at uh, looking at some customer attrition. So what I'm hearing is that if your financials are in decent shape that you can get the financing to do an acquisition, you don't have to have this giant war chest ready to go out and, and buy companies. No, most definitely not. And, and I think that's a mental mind shift that you need to, uh, if this is something you want to pursue, is that you don't have to use your own money. You will most definitely have to provide some security, but the forward revenue, there is quite a few outfits out there now that will allow you to take leverage over your forward revenue. So the increased revenue you have, as long as there are you know, solid contracts over a period of time, that um, you can loan money against that. So you also mentioned after you acquire, there's a big job of integrating the new company into your MSP and the way you do things. I guess there's two ways you could approach an acquisition, right? You could say, okay, now we own you, but you're going to stay independent, you're going to keep your name, you're going to keep the way you do things. There's not a lot of economies of scale and efficiencies that way. So you chose to rebrand, bring them onto the team, um, introduce them to your tech stack, is that right? Yeah, one, one of the um, due diligence things, and we have a, a, a very structured system that we go through. So the DD pack uh, will look at and then rate uh, the different tool set that they use, do they have standard operating procedures, are the procedures similar to ours, uh, what's the culture like. So we will get, you know, if there's four or five people, um, then we'll assign four or five of our people, give them some budget and go and have a, a, a day out and a, maybe a night out and some dinner or whatever it is. And, you know, let, let the, the tribe, if you like, um, do the sniff and scratch and tell, smell test of that person and are they going to be good in our culture? And, what's, and from that, they can get a read on what their culture's like. Is it a good place to work? You know, are they happy? Are they feel uh, actualized? Do they understand with clarity what they're supposed to be doing during the day? And if that's the culture you can bring back in, then all the better. Is this happening as you're evaluating them as an acquisition or after you've already bought them? So what we'll do is do a letter of intent. So we're work, working with the owner. It's obviously got to be on the market and they're willing to enter into some type of deal. And um, we'll do a letter of intent that's subject to our due diligence, and the due diligence will be financial, culture, the things that I just mentioned. So that, that letter of intent uh, will go through a, usually a month-long due diligence process. Um, the letter of intent will set out the, the actual terms of the deal as to if we get through DD, then this is going to be the settlement date, and then there's going to be any earn-out structure that you might do with, with the owner. So last year you acquired a company called Ginger IT, so they're an MSP, right? So that was more of a um, straight slot into your business? Yeah, it's the two things that we mentioned before around buying book and buying capability. Uh, and these guys came with both. You know, the, we, we, we hit the jackpot. I'm not just saying that because they might listen to this podcast, but we hit the jackpot with, uh, with their culture. They were um, you know, very much aligned with how they wanted to be customer obsessed, which is one of the things that we definitely talk about. Uh, they think like customers and, as well and, and then work the solutions back from there. They're not necessarily regimented on the particular tool set. 
but although they can guide that. Um, and we've actually brought the, the owner, uh, who's uh, largely completed his earn out, but his contract was for two years. That was part of the deal. And he thought that he wanted the security of two years. I most definitely wanted him in our business for two years because he's got, uh, got great, great capability. Yeah, so um, they uh, went through that buddy system. We got through due diligence. Um, but we really concentrated on managing the culture. And that's something that Base 2's really big on. Um, we incentivized the team around, um, you know, we actually have engagement surveys with them every four months. Uh, we do try and do that three times a year. And um, we wanted to make sure that their customer engagement, or, or sorry, their team engagement survey is, um, is you know, higher than four and a half out of five. And I can, I can share those questions, there's 12 of them, but so I won't bore you with them all. But the first one is, do you know what you're doing at work on a given day? Do you like it? Would you promote uh, base two if you're standing at a barbecue to someone else? You know, to, to that type of you know, culture. And we want to make sure that they're aligned. And they are, and they are, they're having a great time. Um, I've spoken to them individually and as a team. Uh, we, we took the whole company off to Fiji as a reward. Um, actually, the day after the, the, the whole thing closed for them. So the first uh, round of business that they had was to grab their passport and come to Fiji for three days. So it wasn't a bad way for them to start. Yeah, that's a good way to start, because I know um, when your company is being acquired, there's probably a fear that um, you're going to be made redundant, right? That you might be let go. And so what a way to welcome someone to the company is to take them to Fiji for three days. Yeah, yeah no, it was a fantastic three days. And uh, we did sit down with each, each of them and, um, and make sure that let them know during this process that, um, that their jobs are not on the line, that they need to um, just deliver like they did for Ginger, you know, for all that time. We, we have standards for sure and, and we didn't want them to slip, but um, certainly they, they were um, under no fear of anything to do with restructure. We needed their capability and we we're really clear about that because what like we said before is that it's very hard to find the talent that you need, so we're not going to let it go in a hurry. So you've completed those two acquisitions and now you have one that's uh, sort of in the middle of closing that you can't say too much about. Yeah, still under NDA, so I can't uh, mention the name, but I can talk about it. It's, uh, it's a similar size to Ginger IT. It comes with uh, another you know, book of 250 clients. Um, luckily, New Zealand's economy is big enough that we're actually not going to run out of clients. We're not going to start servicing sheep or anything. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, they've got another 250, and, and it um, is using the debt leverage system that I talked about before. It provides positive cash flow from day one, uh, and we're looking to settle that in our new financial year, which is um, 1 April. So having done these three deals and looking back on it, what would you say are some of the biggest mistakes you made? And the first one was not doing enough due diligence. Uh, it was my personality of everything's going to be awesome. Uh, it probably took over. And from that, we structured the pack. And so I would definitely urge you to uh, you know, either reach out to myself and perhaps we can put that in the show notes as I'll share that with uh, any of the listeners. Um, but it, it talks you through, have a look at their operating procedures, their culture, their, this, and get, assign each one a score. And before you, you, um, you know, enter into any sort of letter of intent, be willing to walk away. And if you're going to lose, lose early. So do those scoring and go, actually, yeah, maybe it's not a good deal. I need to keep looking. And then you'll find one. And uh, as long as you do a, a little bit of a persistent search, you'll find one that just sticks out and, uh, and, and pursue that one. So don't, not, everything's not rosy. So this scoring system is something that you've developed yourself? Yeah, it's a, it's a spreadsheet. It's not a software platform or anything like that. So it's, uh, it's just one that we follow. And um, I've got two other fellow directors, and we sit down and, and uh, analyze the deal. We, we look at whether we want to keep the owner or, or whether the owners might choose to, to exit. Uh, this next one that we're doing, the, the owner's not involved. It comes with the staff and the capability at that end. So. We actually scored this one a while ago, uh, and, it, and it didn't come up. But amazingly, it, it went right through the roof when the owner wasn't involved. Makes a difference. Yeah, I definitely can. And so you need to have a look at that. Um, what, you know, what, what earn out are you looking to provide moving forward? Um, if you want to retain the, if, certainly if it's a hub and spoke business, and by that I mean that you know, all of the capability and the relationships are all around the owner, then most definitely structure an earnout period because you need to transfer those relationships. Um, you need to also think about putting something in place to have a restraint of trade. That person can't leave and then just go and start something else and, and coax those clients that he's had for 10 years or she's had for 15 years across. So you need to protect yourself in, in that side of things. And my other advice is to make sure you get the lawyers involved 
at the as late as possible, okay? Because their job is to actually make the deals go slower and antagonise and you know, make fees out of that. So keep lawyers out of it until later on. Now you've done your acquisitions within New Zealand. Um, you, you mentioned something about a Sydney office. Um, do you think it's safer to stay within your geographic area, or could a company look at you know diversifying geographically with acquisitions? Yeah. So we. The, these deals have all been in New Zealand. The, the office in Australia is a joint venture with uh, with someone else. So you know, it's still based to uh, Australia, and, and we own fifty percent of it. But so does someone that um, was finished as restrained trade and, uh, a long time ago and, and um, started the business over there. But the in New Zealand, the mathematics work better. So your first one, my, my certainly my advice would be to go and uh, find one that's close, that's geographically close, and potentially with that you've got enough room in your own office because you'll want to um, work the mathematics to make sure that uh, you know, the, many, many of the costs and the overheads you can strip out. So you don't need a lease on their cars anymore, or certainly not the owner's one. You don't want their offices anymore. You've not got two stationary bills. There's only one internet feed. You know, there's all, all those little things trickle down. And they all add, add up to a reasonable amount of money. They also add up to the enterprise value that you're looking to acquire and build should you ever want to sell your business in the future. Um, so yeah, let's start off local. Cool. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Just a quick show of hands. How many people have questions for Greg? All right. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. What do you use as deal flow to find your potential acquisition targets? It's a familiar accent, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <coughs> very good question, though. Um, so where, where do we go and look? Um, Look, I, in the first instance, I started off Googling uh, you know, local IT support, and uh, Google does the work for you and gives you all the names of whoever's local. Uh, I then enlisted a business broker to um, go and do some intros and say, look, you know, and the intro goes something like this, hi, I'm ringing on behalf of an interested party, and they are interested in acquiring um, similar type companies to yourself. Is that something that you'd be interested in? Now, don't do it yourself, because that doesn't work. You know, everyone's threatened, and uh, there's immediately some antagony that you'll have to work out of the deal over a period of time, and my experience will tell me that that, you know, that just doesn't work. So find an intermediary, and by using a business broker, they get paid on the commission of the sale. If you're doing the buying, you're not paying them anything anyway, so they'll be motivated by, uh, by someone else's money. Another question here? I, mine was similar. I had a question. Obviously, you didn't do it on your own. I was curious, like, you know, who you worked with, but you sort of answered that, you had a broker. Right, yeah, I mean, look, we had a lawyer, and we, sorry, we still have a lawyer, you know, we haven't changed them out or anything, but we get them involved late. Uh, some of the legal process that we did on the first one is certainly applicable to the following ones, you know, the letter of intent and the contract and the sale and purchase and the conditions and how we do that. We're learning along the way, um, and I'm happy to share those, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, but yes, there is a number of people, and, and certainly identify those beforehand, you know, put down and say, look, if I was selling, then who am I going to speak to? And you're going to come up with those people and put them on a list and uh, let them know that it's your intention to go and do that, and that this is a journey that you're going down. Uh, even try and stick them in a room, you know, even if you're going to invest a little bit of money for a, a lawyer at three, four hundred dollars an hour, or whatever, you're going to make that back. And they know what you're up to. You'd be quite surprised what comes out of it because they'll uh, more than likely have some names in place already. There will be a local business broker and uh, I'd certainly put them in the room as well because they are obviously aware of who's uh, out there and, and doing the deals. If you know anyone that's in your industry as well that has done some acquisitions, find out who their business broker is because that person's obviously working in that field. Just curious as to what your day-to-day -day looks like, where you, where you spend your time. We've got a few other entities that I didn't talk about, actually. So we've created a, a vendor called Zen Contract that does templated proposals on, sits on the front of Autotask. Um, started that a while ago after Rob Ray to, told me to um, put some of our processes into a, a platform and, and uh, hook them into data. So thanks, Rob, for that. But they, and then we've got another one that's around performance management for MSPs. Um, the place in Aussie, and it's all sounding quite busy, isn't it, as soon as I actually say what it is. But, so it's more of a chairman in, in a mentorship role is my day to day. Um, Rob also has me flying around a bit, so um, doing some of these types of events, and, but also promoting you know, what Base2 does and how we go about doing it. 
Uh, my fellow two directors are also consultants to other MSPs. I know uh, Ian Baker, the finance guy, most definitely, and, and he's the auto task guy. Uh, Andrew on the technical side will um, go out and consult to other businesses. And we decided to do that actually quite early on so that we could find out what the good things are that other MSPs are doing and bring it back into our business. In the case of your recent acquisition, uh, can we have more details as to the conversation you had with the MSP owner that you did not want to be a part of the new company? They, they self-selected, but I've had that conversation, so I'm happy to talk about it. Um, it was along the lines of, I think that you have got your business to the point where you're in interested in selling, and the relationship that you have with the owners is never going to transfer across to your the buying party if you're still involved. However, we need you to be a part of the process to uh, work them out, but only for a short period of time. So you can't have them not there at all, because if they're certainly if they're the relationship holders, then they have to work that way. And you'll need to structure the deal to make sure some of the money's left on the table. And we also have it you know, directly in line with how successful they are at transferring the relationships, right? So they transfer all of the relationships to a point where we're all happy, maybe give them a little bonus. If they only get to 80%, then that's not going to, you know, it's not so good, so you want to pay less for that. So I hope that helps. What multiple of EBITDA do you generally base your valuation on? So it is a range between two and a half and six. Now, the, the factors that make it more will be uh, are they cultural fit? Are the standard operating procedures? How easy are they going to be to assimilate? What does their client book look like? Are some of the clients really, really attractive? Have they got some skilled engineers um, and maybe some skilled salespeople, guys and girls that are, that are awesome fit? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to pay more for that. But there is, as soon as it goes over 10 million of annual recurring revenue, the multiplier for some amazing reason, and that's one of the reasons we went down this journey in the first place, it goes from a multiplier of EBIT to a multiplier of revenue. And now that's if it's subscribed. So we, we're at 12 million, um, and about 10 and a half of that now is, is, uh, is recurring if you count the project work that comes from subscribed clients, which is the way that we've been valuing it. So any ad hoc work or procurement doesn't even come into the whole valuation. You're really just going after those long-term contracts and the work that comes with that. Yeah, so it's that. It's, um, it's a factor that is, you know, of those things, right? So do they have standard operating procedures? What do their clients look like? Are they clients that we want to get involved in? And you're going to give them a scoring based on that. And that would go out in your letter of intent and, and formulate part of the deal because you still have to do proper due diligence to be able to actually appropriate the right money. So you can't say, well, we're going to give you, for example, you know, a million dollars. And then you do due diligence and you go back and, and offer them 700 you know, That sort of antagony you're never going to get through. So I would definitely be really open and transparent with the, uh, the, amount of, the type of deal that you're doing before due diligence. So that letter of intent, again, I can share that, is, is making sure that everyone knows exactly what, where the riverbanks are and what's going on. So in the beginning process of actually the, the initial courtship of, of finding somebody that, that you're going to work with or acquire or be acquired. Um, how do you protect yourself from doing due diligence and then having that turn into sort of um, a competitive advantage for the person that you're doing due diligence? How do you protect your information in that process so that, if, especially if you're working in a, in a local community where you're, you're, you would be natural competitors? There's, um, so I'm guessing you're talking you would, if you'd like to expose your books and potentially be acquired. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so then you want to make sure you have a non-compete. So what, what we do is, as part of our uh, initial engagement, we share non-disclosure agreements. Those are bilateral, and they openly state that if we move on from this, any client that has been doing work with the, the to-be-acquired company is off-limits for a period of two years. Because that's the only way you can actually take all of that stress off the table and the person's going to actually be open and honest with their information. Because otherwise, in the past, what we've found is that they hide stuff and they lie because they're you know, just not wanting to um, expose themselves to a risk. So you've got to make sure that you ask for all those risks to be taken off the table. For the uh, <coughs> targeted company, that you are wishing to acquire, if the revenues are exceeding 10 million, you said 
um, the valuation is a multiple. It, what what is the range of uh, the multiples? So typically, and, it's, it's 0.75 up to 1.25 based on the same criteria. You know, are they a good company? Is their reputation great? Do they have standard operating procedures, good clients? You know, it's the same things apply, but the range is a multiplier of revenue, of recurring revenue. So that, I can't speak to that truth in the US market, but it's certainly the way that it's working in Australia and New Zealand. 0 0.075 to 1.25 yeah. of uh, gross annual revenue. Of, of monthly recurring revenue annualized. MRR annualized. On a run rate basis. Yeah. Excellent. Any final questions for Greg? Oh, one more over here. Okay. Would you do a haka for us? No. <laughs> but I tell you what, if, if I, tonight, if I have as much gin as I had last night, there's a very good chance of that. All right, so I'm just going to close off the podcast here. Those of you who are listeners will know the drill here. Thank you, Greg, so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jen. It's great being here. And um, I'll go out and enjoy the sunny California weather. Awesome. So I'm going to put links to the spreadsheet Greg mentioned and any other resources we discussed, as well as Greg's contact info, in today's show notes at avic.com slash franklymsp slash 058. And that's a wrap. Till next time, this is Jennifer Tribe and all the MSPs at Frankly MSP Live. Woo!